to this very special edition of Indianomics coming to you from the sidelines of the JP Morgan Summit. Now, one of the big problems confronting emerging markets like India is that uh, while our inflation appears to be at least heading lower, we are faced with a hostile global environment where most of the leading central banks are promising to keep rates higher for longer. Even then, they don't see their inflation rates converging to their own targets. And the big fear of what will happen in terms of the impact of the large number of hikes that they have taken on growth, when will that impact come? Now, how do emerging markets tackle this uh, uh, hostile environment? I have two people who can exactly take us through this, navigate us and help us understand the global environment. Jahangi Raziz, the uh, chief economist for emerging markets in Asia for JP Morgan, and Louis Uganis, who is the head of emerging markets currencies and commodities research. Gentlemen, thank you very much for your time. Thanks. Uh, Louis, I have to come to you first because there is this genuine fear after the U.S. yields uh, in the last 10 days have raised, what, 50 basis points yep. to, uh, you know, 4.6 percent now. Uh, what does this mean for emerging markets? We were believing that with inflation coming down, there could be a rate cut, probably early 2024. With these yields going up, do you think emerging markets can't dream of a rate cut? So what is happening, what is keeping, uh, uh, forcing the central banks in the developed world to send this message of higher for longer is because inflation is still, you know, it has come down quite a bit, both headline and core, but it's still far from the target. And uh, it seems that DM central banks are willing to take a pause, but they are signaling that they are nowhere near an easing cycle, right? So whatever the market was thinking that they could start cutting you know, by the end of this year or early next year, forget it, right? Maybe this is with the best, uh, in the best of circumstances, second half of 2024 episode. In that environment, only the EM central banks, emerging market central banks that hiked a lot, where nominal and real rates are very high, you know, and we're talking about mostly Latin America, to be honest, and maybe some countries in Central and Eastern Europe, where you see policy rates in real terms of four, five, six, seven percent, which is too high for any economy to sustain, maybe they have the room to cut. Asia, which didn't hike as much, including India, uh, the room for cuts in the near term, honestly, uh, we don't see that. Uh, uh, they, we we're going to be, I think this region is going to be more, more hostage to whatever happens with the Fed. Okay. Well, uh, the U.S. yields itself, uh, Jahangir, let me get you in on that. Yep. Uh, even if the Fed says in its dot chart that there is only one more hike, yep. uh, the 10-year yield, as I just sure. said, has yep. risen how, you know, 50 basis in the last 10, 15 days. What is the end to this? Mm -hmm. Jamie Dimon saying that it can even go to 7%. Do you think there's more in terms of yield increases that we have to be prepared for? So if three months ago you asked me, can uh, 10 years go to 4, you know, and I would say it would go above 4, you would say, no, it's not going to go above 4. So the what? But some CNBC TV 18 said that. That's right. Okay, so we had about 3.8, 3.9 by the end of the year. We've already breached that, right, as, as you said, it was about 4.5%. I think it's reacting to two things. One, of course, is the size of the bond issuance as required to fund this very much larger than expected fiscal deficit of the U.S. And the other is that the more you push, push this Goldilocks, we can't have it both ways. If you're going to push the Goldilocks, then you also have to push the rate cuts away. The more you push the rate cuts away, which the Fed did, the more the tenure would have to steep. I mean, the yield curve has to steepen. So I think that's a combination of the two of them. And our sense is that it directionally is probably headed higher than the lower, unless you tell me that, you know, tomorrow the Fed is going to cut, you know, at ease. That will require the U.S. to go into recession, uh, take the Atlanta Fed. Then now Castro is suggesting the third quarter uh, the growth rate is running above or close to four. That's not a sign of an economy going to recession anytime soon. No, it's not. Uh, uh, four percent, even the Fed said that uh, exactly. GDP yeah. is going to double. Yeah. The June forecast was 1%, yeah. uh, the September forecast is 2.1%. So that's clearly yep. uh, a growth question that I will come back with. But, uh, Louis, the bigger question for India, uh, besides the U.S. yields, is crude price. I mean, uh, not many people told us it would go to 95. What's your sense? Are we stuck at a high figure or is this the worst behind us and we will start see to see it recede? So two things. Um, Demand this year for oil has been rather strong because even if China has been disappointing in terms of headline growth, what we have seen China doing is stockpiling 
both oil and base metals, so that buying from China has continued. Uh, and uh, so this year, it has not been a demand problem. The issue has been on the supply side. You have countries like Iran, like Venezuela, increasing production. Right? Between the two is 900,000 barrels per day of additional production uh, supply this year. So there was an issue of supply glut in the middle of the year that uh, pushed prices down to the 70s. That made OPEC Plus react, right? And Saudi Arabia in particular started to announce cuts uh, some months back. It uh, repeated that uh, over the last uh, uh, month, and that has pushed prices higher. <coughs> Now, when we do the math of uh, supply demand in a very detailed way, we have a hard time getting to 100, 110, 120, which is what many investors seem to be betting on when you look at the strike prices for many of these contracts that are in high demand these days. So we actually are not overly uh, concerned that oil is going to continue on an upward trajectory. Our forecast for the end of the year is actually in back in the, in the mid-80s, so going below 90s. But of course, price momentum and investors making bets in one direction matters, right? It's hard to incorporate that into our models, right? But again, the fundamentals, supply demand, justify prices in the 80s or, or maybe low 90s, not in the 100 handle. That's a, a very Which is good news for India. Absolutely. <laughs> One of the biggest importers. But, you know, one of the trends, or uh, positive trends for India has been the general disinflation. Yes. Uh, for which perhaps China is responsible yes. because it was a demand that was not. So, uh, Jahangir, can you draw up uh, the Chinese situation for sure. us? Uh, there are some very dire uh, explanations that they have got into a, a debt deflation loop. Uh, you know, local governments trying to reduce debt and therefore not inflating the economy, not stimulating the economy. Do you see Chinese growth as under siege? Look, I mean, we have gone through every couple of years' time that China is about to implode because of the debt problem. It hasn't happened, and most likely it is not going to be that. It's not going to be the cause, largely because most of the debt is locally owned. Uh, you know, Luis and I have been covering emerging markets. The problem with the emerging market always is when the debt is owned by foreigners. It is not when the debt is owned locally. So, yes, it is going to be a headwind to growth. It has been a headwind to growth for quite some time. But that's not the way in which, you know, the, the, a crisis is going to emerge, the way in which somebody else or some other people might be talking about. I think the problem with China is that we tend to think about only one shock that hit China, which is the lockdowns associated with the pandemic. And then we focus on the reopening and what is happening to the reopening. What we forget is that China was hit with two other shocks. One shock was this capricious regulatory decisions that were taken across the board from cancelling IPOs to letting two of the largest uh, real estate developers go bankrupt to turning a completely vibrant private sector driven uh, sector called private tutorials into non, non, that's right, non, non, the thing, the tech companies. And that has resulted in business sentiment languishing at this point in time. So just to give you a sense, 60% of investment in China is the, is the private sector, the ones that we look at every month, FAI investment. That 60% is, is running at minus two. So private sector has not participated either in this recovery, either from the corporate side or from the household side, which you can look at the retail sales. On the other hand, what we have seen is that the fiscal, fiscal policy has been geared almost exclusively in supporting the corporate side. China has been the only uh, major, industrial country, major country that has had positive industrial production growth throughout this year. No other country has. Most of them are running in negative numbers, right? So as a result, there is a massive amount of excess supply in China which is reflected in a huge, you know, uh, Louis talked about inventory buildup on the commodity side. There's a massive buildup of finished good commodities. That is having an impact, as normally it would do, in a significant amount of disinflation within China and export prices going down, go, slowing down. So right now, U.S. dollar export prices is running at minus 15. It has been negative for the last, you know, four or five months. So I think that will continue to play a role. Uh, in, in this, in this, in this disin disinflation field, and unless China addresses its private sector issue, business confidence, 
it's very hard to see China going back to the kind of growth rates that we had been used to, merely if it adds another 1% of GDP in fiscal deficit. But broadly, for uh, us outsiders, uh, can we take for granted that this disinflation, especially in core, is likely to continue at least for the next... As long as there is excess supply within China, it will continue. If you have finished good inventories go up, that, those finished good inventories have to be the thing. So that will continue. Core inflation down is a premise that... Yeah, but the, but the question is what you started off the, the discussion with. Is it going down to the comfort level of, of the central banks? For none of these economies, it is going down to the comfort level yeah, of central banks. Down to 4% even for us. That's correct. And that is where the concern is. Because as long as you don't get it down to the comfort level, the central banks across the world are still in play. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. The 7%. Yes. Uh, they're still in play. Okay. Now, uh, let me come back to that. Both yep. the China uh, impact as well as uh, yep. the U.S. Uh, yield and therefore the high dollar. Now, let me come to currencies. Uh, Louis, what, what's the uh, impact on a currency like the Indian rupee? Uh, we, we are celebrating the JP Morgan index, uh, including India. So the next 18 months, we get at least 25 billion, if not more. So how do you view the rupee? The rupee, I think there's been uh, the dynamics, the fundamental dynamics for the rupee are quite supportive. Right? You have the current account deficit that has shrunk significantly. We're celebrating 10 years after the taper tantrum episode that unfortunately India was included along with so many other EM economies that uh, were hit by uh, the episode of the U.S. hiking rates uh, and generating a lot of currency pressures, a lot of all kinds of market pressures that we're not seeing this time around. So. Kudos for you know the progress that India has made in terms of reducing its macroeconomic imbalances, and I think that the rupee you know uh, you know is, is probably closer to fair value. It was quite overvalued uh, right before the taper tantrum happened. Right uh, from that perspective, uh, uh, you would think that you know there is room for stability for the rupee. However, we are expecting the dollar on a trade weighted basis to probably continue to appreciate. Because you have this strong growth momentum we've been discussing the, uh, 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 with the U.S., the high yields and the higher for long, that is dollar supportive, right? And we haven't discussed Europe, uh, but Europe is actually disappointing in growth. In the, uh, China is disappointing in growth. So the trade weighted dollar is only going higher. It's very difficult for EM currencies to appreciate against the dollar when the dollar is appreciated against other reserve currencies, which is what we expect in the next few quarters, right? So. For the time being, we do have a, a, a forecast of you know, the, the rupee staying around 83. Can it reach 84 next year because the dollar continues to appreciate? For sure. But we think that when you compare the rupee with other pairs, currency pairs in the region, my guess is that it's going to actually appreciate. Yields are, you know, relatively speaking, higher in India compared to the rest of Asia. That's going to provide probably some cushion. And positive, and there's a positive real rate, which other central banks are not delivering yet. Any number for the uh, rupee yuan rate? Because India's biggest deficit is with China. And it is believed that the central bank looks at uh, that rate as well. Do you expect the Chinese yuan also to depreciate even more already 7.3? Well, um, you know, we have a forecast of 7.4 for year end uh, or sometime in the first quarter of next year. However, strictly speaking, if you were to do the math, okay, of just purely on yield differentials, China versus the rest of the world, particularly the Fed, you would probably see the yuan at 7.50, 7.60. That is not our forecast. Why? Because at 7.30, 7.32, we are seeing a lot of intervention, a lot of a policy, a deliberate policy to contain currency depreciation, which will probably continue for a good, for a good reason, which is probably concerns about financial stability comes into play. Uh, and uh, so that's why we have 7.40 instead of 7.60. Now, 7.40, moving from where we are to 7.40, is more than what we're expecting in terms of the rupee to depreciate. So I think that the rupee, interestingly enough, is going to appreciate most likely against the yuan.